Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's very good to be here. These are always excellent conferences, and I'm uh, grateful to uh, Tim, to Juan, and uh, Mr. Pudner, and all the other organizers, and not forgetting Gail and, and Susanna. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of Steve Hankey. The first part of what I s am going to say is Steve's part of uh, what he was going to present. And then I'm going to add something on the end of that. Now, the first part is really talking about the long-term relationship between money and inflation. The second part is talking more about the, the current business cycle that we're in. The consensus, I would say, of central bankers and academic and business economists about the current episode of inflation <clears throat> is by and large that it has been, uh, that it has resulted from a whole series of unexpected shocks and interruptions to supply chains. Uh, and then of course there was the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine, which for them exacerbated the situation. And Steve Hankey has a great quote here. He says, um, rem do you remember the film uh, Casablanca? And there's a famous line from Captain Louis Renault, who says, round up the usual suspects. Here what's happened is the central banks have rounded up the usual non-monetary suspects. But as Milton Friedman taught us, the one and only source of inflation is excess money growth. Um, the real culprit is, is not you know, those non-monetary suspects. Uh, the real culprit is, is excess money. As Milton Friedman famously said, inflation is always and everywhere <clears throat> a monetary phenomenon. Or, more precisely, I know of no exception to the proposition that there has to be a one-to-one -one relationship between substantial rises in prices and substantial rises in the stock of money. Substantial, okay? We're not talking about very small uh, movements. Why might this be the case? The monetary understanding of the transmission mechanism looks something like this. That when the rate of growth of money changes for a sustained period of time and by a substantial amount, so for example, if it doubled, it went from 5% to 10% and stayed at that 10% for a year or, or something, at least six months then you've got a, su a sustained and sub substantial change. The first impact would be on asset prices coming at, in a time frame of sort of a few months. Uh, the second impact would be on economic activity coming roughly at six to 18 months after the uh, surge in money growth. And then the impact on inflation, anything from 12 to 24 months, although it could be as long as 36 months or, you know, it's, a, and the, the length and variability of these lags is partly what has undermined the credibility of monetary economics. Because modern economics is so obsessed with getting high correlations over short-term periods, you know, uh, they always say this doesn't work. But of course, that doesn't mean that this isn't the correct transmission mechanism. This is how it really works. But you know, defining that or getting that uh, in a statistical form with a very high uh, regression coefficient and so on, R squared, is, is difficult. Mm. But it doesn't make it any less true. So, um, there was, no, what I'm going to share with you is, is um, actually uh, three studies. First, you have on your uh, chairs this um, brochure and that has this well-known chart that everybody's seen on the relationship between money growth and uh, inflation sorry nominal GDP um, over the period tw 1980 to 2018 and it's <coughs> laid out with individual countries showing the growth of the quantity of money and the growth of national income those are the two lines here and you can see they, know they pretty much match each other um, 
from low inflation countries like Japan and Germany on the left uh, to countries like Mexico and Turkey on the right. Now, there is also a study done by the, by the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis which asked the question, you know, what is the relationship between um, money and inflation over long periods? This study was done by George McCandless and Warren Weber, writing in the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis Quarterly Review for 2001. They used 30 years of data for 110 countries uh, from 1960 to 1990, and um, so that, and they were measuring basically exactly the same sort of the same idea here. You take a long period of time, you take the average rate of change or geometric rate of change over the entire period, and then check the correlation you know, of those or, or uh, see, see uh, how well those match. And you can see these correlation coefficients for each. Each definition of money is pretty high, um, and then it's split down into a couple of areas, um, the OECD countries and 14 Latin American countries. They did this for 110 countries. Now, what um, these findings closely comport with Friedman, Friedman's assertion that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between substantial rises in prices and substantial rises in the stock of money. Now, what Steve has done in his study is to update that. And he's used data from the IMF for the, for the IMF uh, Statist International Financial Statistics Database for the period 1990 to 2021. Um, he, for each country with 20 or more years of data, that a total of 147 countries, uh, he and his um, associates in Baltimore calculated the geometric rate of growth for consumer prices and M2, money held by the public, that can be easily used in transactions. And again, you get very, some very high correlations. And those, the overall score of 0.94 for M2 is very similar uh, to the McCandless and Weber result, which was 0.95 for 110 countries. So uh, that relationship has not changed in the 30 years since the McCandless and, uh, and Weber study. Um, so when uh, Jerome Powell says changes in monetary aggregates haven't been a good predictor of the economy or inflation, he is simply wrong. Right? He doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, now, various of us, notably Tim, uh, myself and Steve Hankey later uh, um, forecast the inflation and we're going to talk about that forecast. But just first to provide you with a graphic representation of what I've just shown you uh, statistically. Um, on the horizontal axis we've got the average annual rate of growth of M2 for all those hundred and actually 139 countries, because some were jettisoned because they were outliers. Um, countries like China or Vietnam, where a lot of the growth of money was absorbed by very high real GDP growth rates. So that gives you a higher... That doesn't mean that the relationship with prices is wrong, but <laughs> it does change the, the statistical presentation a bit. Anyway, and on the vertical axis, we have the average an annual rate of inflation. And you can see, again, there's a pretty good correlation there, um, and the origin of that line is fairly close to the, uh, the, the, the zero point for both axes. So the update uh, for, by Steve and his associates came pretty close to replicating uh, the McCandless-Weber results. Um, as Steve puts it, there is a tight relationship between the growth rate in the money supply and inflation. These measurements support Friedman's famous dictum, inflation is always an everywhere monetary phenomenon, and they refute officialdom's refrains about the irrelevance of the monetary cause of inflation and the, and the supremacy 
of non-monetary causes of inflation. Now, what I want to do in the remaining 10 minutes um, is to go back to the transmission mechanism and talk about this particular cycle and what we've seen. Because we're, we're now into stage two or phase two of this cycle. The first phase was in 2020 and 2021, <coughs> flowing over into 2022 and 2023. First, we had very rapid money growth. Then we had a surge in asset prices. And then we had economic activity recovering very strongly. And then we had inflation. So you know, that fits like a glove, the circumstances which have followed from the uh, egregious expansions of money engineered by central banks during the COVID period. Um, what I think is interesting to do is to actually then specify what has happened in each, each box or in each part of the flowchart. So on the left here, we've got between March of 2020 and March of 2022, using M2 for the United States, the average rate of growth of money was 17.4% per annum. <clears throat> that is three times, just over three times what I calculate to be the appropriate rate of growth of money for the US, which would be about five or 6% max. So even you know, giving that, making that a high number, through treble the rate of growth appropriate. And then between March of, March of um, from March 23rd of 2020 to January 3rd of 2022, the S&P uh, equity index increased by 114%, and the Case-Shiller Home Price Index increased by 43%. Now, you couldn't possibly attribute that to disruptions in supply chains. You couldn't attribute that to the war in Ukraine. That is a monetary, was a consequence of the monetary expansion. Next, we had this big surge in GDP. Uh, the average in 21 and 22, not, it didn't take 20 because the economy turned down very sharply, obviously, because of COVID and the, and the lockdowns. But with 4.1%, that's an year on year. That's the average. Now, the US cannot possibly grow at 4.1% on average over any extended period of time. So this was a, a, a surge in growth prompted by the surge in spending power produced by the excess money. And then inflation uh, was quite, you know, in 21 and 22, was 6.4% on average again. So a lot, I mean, three times the 2% target inflation. Um, this is the same thing. Steve gave this presentation recently in Iowa. He's from Iowa State. Um, and he used Iowa farmland uh, for the land price increases. Land, land prices in Iowa were up 30.4%. Residential house prices were up 27.6%. These are not random. These are consistent across any state in the United States. But now we've moved on because monetary policy, excuse me, monetary growth has changed dramatically. Instead of having a huge surge in money, we've now had a sharp contraction. So between March of 2022 and August of 2023, the average annual growth of money has been 1.1%, or on an annualized basis, minus 2.7%. So it's been falling sharply. The S&P peaked out January 3rd, 2022, and it's down about 25% since then. Um, the case Shiller Home Price Index is down 5%. Um, economic activity has slowed considerably. There's a very interesting dis dis difference between GDP, which has averaged about 2.5%, and gross domestic income, which is down by 0.5%. Now, those two should match, but they haven't yet made those t made that um, reconciliation, the statisticians in Washington. And then inflation is still reflecting the prior overhang of money. One way of thinking about this and to sort of deal with the time lags is these are the annual rates of change of the items in the equation of exchange. So we've got delta M2, delta velocity, delta real GDP, and delta inflation, uh, CPI and uh, the 
the, the, uh, the deflator uh, for the GDP. And what you can see is in 2020 and 2021, the sort of pink shaded areas, we had this big surge in money. Velocity, which is the inverse of holdings of money. Velocity falls very sharply, holdings of money surge. But the effect on real GDP doesn't come till the next year or two. And the, year, and the impact on inflation doesn't come until uh, you know, two years later and three years later. All right? So I call this the rat passing through the snake. Now, the snake has followed the rat, and you gradually see it sort of dim diminishing in size as it sort of flows back through the snake. <clears throat> but that's the way to think about it. And then these red, the numbers in red are my attempt at a forecast of what's going to happen. But basically, because we've now had such an extended period of negative money growth, I think we will have below 2% growth um, of inflation in 2024. And probably at the moment, it looks as though we will have deflation in 2025. Two ways to present, visualize this. Steve likes to do it relative to what he calls the golden growth rate for money. This is the cal calculated appropriate growth rate of M2 or to achieve the inflation target. And it turns out to be about 5.5% um, or 6. I think, and I, I think he's got it at 6.3. You know, you can dispute that. Depends what time period you, you do the averaging over. But anyway, basically we had this huge surge in money growth during the early part of COVID. And recently, money growth has gone abruptly negative. Now, many people say, well, we needed the slower money growth because we had excess money growth in the past. And this, these will even out or average up. But that's not the way it works. The, these things work sequentially. So the, the impact of this has already, as we saw, it's already had its impact on asset prices. It's had its impact on re real GDP. And it's had its impact on inflation. So this is kind of dissipating. It's not having any effect any further. And what's coming next is this part. And we've now had 18 months of negative money growth rate. We, ne we haven't seen that since the 1930s. There was a brief period in 48, 49, I think. But the, the, but the decline was much less than we've had recently. So that's one way of looking at it. I, the way I prefer to look at it is like this. That is, this is the ratio. It's the inverse of velocity. So it's the ratio of money to GDP. So if you think of it as how much money people want to hold, the demand for money. So what we have is the, the, the uh, solid yellow line is uh, the actual trend uh, or the, the actual, uh, the actual uh, ratio of um, money to GDP. And then the dashed line is the trend calculated up to 2019 and then projected, so pre-COVID. And since COVID, with the huge increase in, in money growth and the decline in economic activity, the amount of money holding surge. So this is what has created the excess spending and the inflation pressure. And the question is how much more of an overhang is still left? <coughs> and we've, we haven't yet had third, third quarter data. This is second quarter data. At that point, at this final point in the chart, the gap between that and the trend, the pre-COVID pre trend, is about 4.5%. But, but we shouldn't try to be too precise. It doesn't mean that uh, at midnight on December 31st that US consumers will have run out of money. I mean, this is, uh, broadly speaking, the fuel in the tank is, is used up. And the engine, or the, engine the, the car is now running on fumes. At some point, this whole thing is going to tip over rather abruptly and rather seriously. And that will be followed by deflation, as I, as I said. So in my opinion, central banks, far from being just sort of cavalier, have actually been thoroughly destabilizing in this episode. First, they put their foot too hard on the accelerator. Now they're putting their foot too hard on the brake. And Steve and I will continue to maintain that campaign. Uh, we've got a piece coming out in the Wall Street Journal in the next day or so.
uh, which you should see. Thank you very much.